and welcome to today's webinar, Congenital CMV, Standards of Care, Knowledge Gaps, and a Story. I'm Christy Jewell of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin Molecular. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit molecular.diasorin.com. Now we encourage you to participate today by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box to the left and click submit. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also use this ask a question box to let us know if you're having any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I would now like to welcome our speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Laura Gibson. Associate Professor, Departments of Medicine and Pediatrics, UMass Chan Medical School. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Gibson, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, good, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here, um, and I am, I am hoping that you become as interested in congenital CMV infection as I am through uh, the course of my discussion. So um, a few disclosures. I work with Moderna Therapeutics. Um, I'm a member of their scientific advisory board and, and receive some research funding from them, and I'll be talking about some off-label uses here. So our learning objectives are to understand the standard of care for congenital CMV diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment, to recognize areas of care for which evidence is lacking, unclear, or pending, and gain awareness of the family experience and the impact of their CCMV advocacy work. So we'll start with that family story. Um, this is a family uh, that I took care of in uh, when their baby was in the NICU, the neonatal ICU. So this is Vanessa. Um, at the time, she was a 28-year-old woman. She was pregnant with her second child, uncomplicated, in particular, no febrile illnesses. Her lab tests were normal. Her ultrasounds were normal at 9, 12, and 18 weeks. She went to the emergency department at about 25 and a half weeks after a minor fall in her backyard, just as a precaution. But an ultrasound at that time showed um, a few abnormalities, borderline prominence of the lateral ventricles, and that's um, the ventricles are fluid-filled structures in the brain echogenic bowel suggesting inflammation and a small pericardial effusion that which is fluid around the heart. So she um, lives with her husband, an 18 month old child. There's Sam, a picture of Sam, and uh, she's an elementary school teacher. So one of the first um, uh, area of uncertainty uh, that I'll highlight of several um, throughout our discussion is that there's no um, there's no ideal or perfect way to diagnose CMV in pregnancy. So there are a number of different types of infection, CMV infection. Um, primary infection when someone gets the virus for the first time. Reinfection when they get a new virus on top of the one they already have and reactivation, which is the virus comes out of dormancy and becomes active in the body. So um, currently screening <clears throat> for CMV in pregnancy is not recommended, and that's because of a number of reasons. Um, and we'll go over a bit later diagnosis of CMV in pregnancy, but there's currently um, no standard of care uh, at least in the U.S. Some other countries do this regularly, but there's no standard of care um, for screening for CMV in pregnancy. So 
So a few words about cytomegalovirus itself. So the herpes virus family um, contains several viruses. They all have some commonalities. They have a large and complex genome. They have a typical virion structure you can see um, here in the top left, where um, regardless of the, of the different viruses, they all have that structure. And they're all characterized by latency or dormancy in the body with intermittent reactivation, where, as I said, the virus becomes active um, in the body and basically wants to do that in order to pass on to the next um, host. So the, um, there, as I said, a number of viruses in the herpes virus family. Um, herpes simplex, so they're, they're actually divided into subfamilies, alpha, beta, gamma. And um, they contain a number of viruses that most of which you might have heard of. Herpes simplex virus, varicella virus, which is the chickenpox virus. CMV is a beta herpes virus. And then EBV is the monovirus um, down at the bottom, uh, which is a gamma herpes virus. So they all originally started with um, name the name human herpes virus and then a number. So HHV5 is what CMV is um, technically or historically. So they are all they all transmit in some sort of body fluid. So looking at CMV, the um, CMV is typically spread through saliva, genital secretions, urine, breast milk, and blood. So the virus likes to um, get to one of these body fluids so it can pass to the next host. And the, the different viruses are latent in a variety of different places. So CMV in particular is um, found in uh, some immune cells and inside the lining of blood vessels and in uh, glands like the salivary gland and the kidney, kidneys. So a, a few basic numbers that are important to understand. Um, not quite half of women of uh, childbearing potential are have CMV already as they if they become pregnant. So um, not quite half of, of women have the virus already, and the other half have never had it before. Um, as they become adults. So <clears throat> about 2% of all seronegative pregnant women, meaning seronegative means their antibody is negative, um, their IgG antibody, um, and that's called seronegative. So about 2% of seronegative pregnant women get CMV for the first time during pregnancy. In that case, the risk of transmission to the fetus is about 30 to 40%. So most of the time, uh, the virus does not transmit to the fetus. But in non-primary infection, we do not know the risk of transmission to the fetus. So what I mean by non-primary infection is those other two types of infections I mentioned earlier, which is reinfection. So a new virus on top of, of the one that someone already has, or reactivation, which is um, reactivation from, from latency into an active form within the body. And so the reason we don't know much about these types of infection um, involving people who have had CMV in the past is that the way we diagnose um, CMV infection, at least primary for the first time, is seroconversion from negative IgG to positive IgG. But in people who have already had CMV in the past, they already have a positive IgG antibody, 
And so we have no way, we don't know how to measure these other two non-primary infections. And that's a particular challenge um, when these individuals are pregnant. <clears throat> So overall, the incidence of congenital CMV infection is about 0.6 to 0.7% of all live births every year. And this is a number that's pretty consistent across the world in, in, in countries where it's been measured. So looking at the United States, for um, live birth data, the most recent available is 2019. About, if we, if we calculate 0.6% of all of those live births, that's over 22,000 infants in the US that were born in 2019, and that's approximately the number every year. And then thinking more about Massachusetts, which is where I am, um, that translates to over 400 infants um, in Massachusetts born in 2019 with congenital CMV. The problem is that we don't know um, who they are. And we'll talk about neonatal screening a little bit later. So if we're looking at all causes of sensory neural hearing loss in children, uh, CMV is responsible for about a fifth of all hearing loss in children. So it's the most common non-genetic cause of hearing loss in children. Um, it's also very clear that uh, the, um, the effect or the burden of disease uh, of congenital CMV varies by race and ethnicity. So. The birth prevalence of congenital CMV is higher in black and multiracial infants, and it's quite a bit higher um, compared to other, um, other races and um, ethnic groups, his, Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic whites, and Asians. So significantly higher in black and multiracial um, infants, and the uh, adjusted, the adjusted or unadjusted um, prevalence odds ratio um, is much higher, up to 3.5, and then around two for the adjusted rates. In addition, CMV infected infants are more likely to be black and have public or no health insurance compared to non-infected infants. So these are the the numbers here and in this, this um, pretty recent epidemiologic study that um, the, it, in 50% of CMV positive um, infants, for example, are black compared to CMV negative infants at 24%. Um, and 82% of infected infants have public or no insurance compared to 64% for CMV negative in infants. And there are several other studies that show um, these racial and ethnic disparities. So if we look at primary infection, meaning who's getting CMV for the first time, um, here we have the, um, the rate I was talking about earlier of pregnant women. So about 2% of pregnant women get the virus for the first time every year. This one or 2% is the general public, which is um, blood donors is the easiest way to measure CMV in the, in the general public. Um, there, there's one particular risk factor for individuals to get CMV for the first time. So, Parents of infants who are shedding CMV, and what that means is they have a lot of virus in the saliva or urine. So um, exposure to those body fluids is a high risk of transmission. So parents um, who have a young child with CMV in the urine or saliva get CMV. Um, they have a 24% risk of getting CMV every year compared to one to 2%, as I said, in the, in the general public. 
daycare providers, so these are individuals who work with um, children in a, in a child care setting, um, or parents um, who, or child care providers or parents who are exposed to children possibly shedding CMV. And so in child care, uh, a large number of, of children uh, could be shedding CMV at any time because CMV is one of those infections that goes around um, large groups of children like many other infections we know about. And so even if we don't know whether the children are shedding CMV, those providers or those parents, um, seroconvert at, at about 8% per year. And then um, the seroconversion rate in women in high seroprevalence communities, meaning communities or countries where nearly all individuals have um, had CMV in the past at a very young age, which is different from the 30 to 50% seroprevalence that I was talking about earlier. So um, the, the rate of, of new infection or reinfection or even those small number of women who are seronegative, um, they get the, the infection, CMB infection at a very high rate as well because there's a lot of virus going around a community where um, most people are, or the vast majority of, of people are um, infected already. So what's the burden of congenital CMV disease? If you look at children, the number of children who um, have these various um, pediatric conditions every year, um, and the conditions include um, HIV, fetal alcohol syndrome, Down syndrome. Congenital CMV disease is right at the top in terms of number of children uh, affected per year. And if we look at the screening programs that we have already, so the newborn screening program, it involves a dried blood spot and um, these are at the on the x-axis are all of those conditions that are in the newborn screen in that dried blood spot and we um you know cystic fibrosis um metabolic disorders all of those put together um result in diagnosis of about 6400 infants per year so the hearing screen it, which is done on all babies before they're discharged from the hospital when they're born. The hearing screen identifies about 5,000 infants per year with potential um, hearing loss. But if we were to um, have a newborn screening program for congenital CMV, um, we would identify more infants than all the dried blood spot testing combined or all the hearing screen testing. So that CMV screening of newborns would have meaningful benefit to at least as many children as are already helped by existing newborn screening programs. Unfortunately, the degree of CMV awareness among women, this is a study performed among women. Um, the percent who had heard of each of these conditions here on the on the y-axis, fetal alcohol syndrome, SIDS, Down syndrome, despite the very large birth prevalence of congenital CMV, only a small minority, 13%, had ever heard of CMV or congenital CMV. So a bit more, a bit about transmission, um, the risk by gestational week um, does vary. So on the x-axis is gestational week. Um, these weeks are, are those before, um, before conception. The red arrow is at conception. So the average is the black line. Um, there is, there can be CMV transmission uh, to the fetus um, if 
primary infection occurs in, in a, the pregnant individual before conception. So the lowest rate of transmission is in the first trimester and the highest rate is in the third trimester. So this is where the 30 to 40% average um, is, uh, is depicted. So there are a number of things that are predictive of CMV transmission, meaning in studies where, where women are um, identified as transmitting or not transmitting the virus. So depending on what antibodies they have, depending on what um, T cells they respond with, those can be associated with risk of, of uh, fetal transmission. So a number of things are not predictive, meaning it doesn't matter what these values are. We can't say anything about, about the risk of transmission. So it doesn't matter what um, the severity of maternal symptoms are. Most of the um, women that I've seen, almost all of them have said, no, I was never sick during pregnancy. And it doesn't matter the amount of virus um, in the blood uh, in terms of the risk of transmission. So we're, we don't have good biomarkers of risk of transmission for pregnant individuals. And as a, an, an illustration of how the virus transmits, um, or at least the cell types that might be involved, here's a picture of the maternal fetal interface. And so on the right is the uterus side, which is the maternal side. On the left is the placenta, which is fetal tissue. Um, this, this sort of columnar um, structure is an anchoring called an anchoring villus, and these cells intercalate into the um, into the uterus. And um, this structure over here is similar, but a floating villus. It doesn't um, extend into the uterus. These red cells depict. Um, CMV infected cells. And so um, they can become infected and pass through to the fetal side um, from maternal endometrial glands um, cells, lymphatic vessels, uterine blood vessels. So they're all mixed together here. And so the, the virus, virus infected cells can cross over into the fetal side. At the same time, the, um, the protective effect of maternal immunity, so certainly there's maternal immunity at the maternal fetal interface. There are a number of immune cells, although this is the, it's a, it's a immunodeficient milieu in that, in that location. So the protective effect of maternal immunity on CMV transmission is unknown, um, meaning we don't know how much the um, how much it helps to have had CMV in the past when someone is pregnant, meaning there's some immunity, versus getting CMV for the first time during pregnancy. So if we take a thousand non-immune women, um, hundred percent are susceptible, and we don't we we just mean that they have not had the virus before. They convert in this study about three percent per year. There's a 30% transmission rate or so. And that um, calculates out to a birth prevalence of 0.9% in this study. So pretty close to the 0.6 to 0.7%. If we're looking at um, 1,000 immune women, meaning they've had CMV in the past, we don't know what susceptible means we don't know the number of seroconversions because these women are already seropositive. We don't know how to measure this. So we don't know how to measure reinfection um, where they might have acquired a new virus. We certainly don't know the transmission rate. We don't have any way of um, measuring that because we can't identify the women. But we still see a birth prevalence about 1.2%. So that means the birth prevalence or the number of infants born to with CMV infection to non to seronegative women or seropositive women is about the same. And this was one of the um, major 
findings in the last several several years, at least five years. So you might hear a comparison between, you know, the risk of transmission is 30% in women who are zero negative getting the virus for the first time and 1% in women who have had CMV in the past. The problem is that these are not the same. <laughs> Um, these are these are apples and oranges. Really, the comparison is between the birth prevalence. So comparing the birth prevalence, really the same number of infants are born to both um, types of women, seronegative and seropositive. So it's important to remember that. Um, certainly, uh, CMV immunity is likely protective. We just don't know the um, degree to which it's protective. So for, um, as we were talking about earlier, prenatal diagnosis is typically, it can be done, prenatal diagnosis, and that means prenatal diagnosis of primary infection. As I said, if CMV IgG antibodies are already positive, we can't, we can't do maternal serology because what we're looking for is um, an IgG and an IgM done on an ELISA. The IgM is confirmed on a Western blot. If these two tests are positive, we can do a, an IgG avidity study, which basically looks at how strong the antibody binds to the virus. Fetal um, diagnosis occurs by uh, amniocentesis. So we do CMV PCR on the amniotic fluid. It really cannot be done before about 20 to 21 weeks of gestation because there needs to be robust uh, urine, fetal urine mixed into the amniotic fluid, and that's where the virus is um, uh, in during pregnancy and, and when infants are born. There's a lot of virus in the urine. And the um, Amniocentesis needs to be done at least at least six weeks after maternal infection, which we usually don't know, but um, because it takes time for the virus to um, get into the pregnant individual, circulate, get across the placenta, into the fetus. So there's a there's some risk of false negative results if an amniocentesis is done before about 20 weeks, or if um, it turns out that the um, there was maternal infection less than six weeks previous to the amnio. The fetal blood can be tested, but that's um, rarely done. The IgG avidity, a bit a bit more about this test. Um, so the IgG avidity can only be done if the IgG is positive. So we can't we can't do this on a person with an only IgM positive. It's a um, it's a test we do routinely to see if primary infection um, has occurred recently or a long time ago. And this and this test allows some probability of understanding that because the, the question is, did primary infection occur during during pregnancy or after conception, or did it occur quite a while before conception? And so if the, IG, if the IgG avidity is very low um, in this red box, there's a 98% positive predictive value. So we can be very sure that if the, ver if the IgG avidity index is very low, um, there's a 98% positive predictive value that primary infection occurred within the previous three months. So that's a a very helpful test result. If the um, if the index is intermediate or high, the negative predictive value is about 88% that primary infection did not occur in the previous three months. So this is when the binding is stronger, it means the infection occurred in the more distant past. The problem is that most 
of the women I think I've ever seen with this test, it's somewhere in the middle. So we're really guessing, um, you know, when did when did um, primary infection occur? And it's often, you know, a, a complete estimate of was it three or four months ago? Was it not? And this is the um, struggle we can get into with prenatal diagnosis. So getting back to our family, um, Vanessa had a couple of ultrasounds after her, her first one in the emergency department, and she also had an evaluation for um, congenital infections, and her CMV testing showed IgG and IgM positive, which is, the, is what we're looking for to consider the diagnosis of primary infection. The, um, the ultrasounds showed at 26 and 27 weeks a number of very concerning findings. Severe IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction, where the estimated fetal weight was only about 5,500 grams. That's hardly a pound. Um, enlarged heart, the brain was normal. And then these conditions are particularly concerning spontaneous decelerations of the fetal heart rate and um, particularly reverse and diastolic flow in the umbilical artery. So then congenital CMV disease has a number of findings on physical exam, and this is in general. A number of them are listed there. You might have heard this disease called the blueberry, uh, blueberry muffin syndrome. And the reason for that is some infants can be born with these sort of purplish lesions here, which is different from this sort of darker red rash, which is due to low platelets and, um, and bleeding in capillaries. These purplish spots here are, happen um, in the skin because they're here and it's called extramedullary hematopoiesis. This happens because the virus is so suppressive, suppressive of the fetal bone marrow that the bone marrow cells um, distribute into the, into the fetal tissues and set up in the skin in particular to um, try to be sort of metastatic bone marrow to generate the cells that the, that the fetus needs. This is a very rare finding, but it's a typical finding of congenital CMV. So then if, if infants look like this, um, at birth, why um, why is there a discussion going on in the field about CMV newborn screening? Meaning um, testing most, if not all, infants uh, it, regardless of how they appear at birth. So the rationale for newborn screening, it provides parents knowledge, support, and resources. It may explain abnormalities that develop later in childhood. There's limited capacity for retrospective diagnosis, going back to the dried blood spot. Um, one of the most important things is that it initiates an evaluation that would not be done otherwise for infants that appear normal at birth. We um, monitor with hearing, we monitor hearing and neurodevelopment, even if treatment is not pursued. Um, it qualifies infants for a variety of services, even if they appear normal at birth, at least in Massachusetts. And certainly there's an opportunity for research and availability of future interventions. So area, an area that we don't know um, about in terms of a national or statewide screening programs, we don't really know the cost effectiveness. There have been several modeling studies that have shown cost effectiveness, but no, no vig, uh, rigorous sort of measuring, uh, measuring the cost of screening. And we don't know if it's beneficial to know if infants who appear normal at birth, which is most of the congenitally infected infants, we don't know if it will be helpful for them to have a diagnosis of congenital CMV. 
And the, the reason that some people argue that that's a risk is that those infants may go through procedures they don't need or carry labels they don't need in their health record or otherwise um, you know, not benefit from having the diagnosis. So we, we don't really know the answer. The rationale, there's much more rationale than I've shown, but there's, there aren't good studies to show that there's no risk to or low risk of, of screening to asymptomatic infants. So how do we screen? The um, typical test is the saliva. We do a CMV PCR. And if that's positive, we do a, um, a urine PCR. And that's because the positive predictive value of a saliva PCR is on the lower side. And usually our false positive results um, result from uh, result from breast milk or other contamination into the into the sample. Diagnosis has to be made within three weeks of age, because after three weeks of age, um, the the virus could have been acquired after birth. You know, say from siblings or or family contacts or or um, childcare settings, et cetera. So the diagnosis has to be made within three weeks of age. Um, there are a couple of types of newborn screening, at least two that, that we refer to um, in the present. One is targeted screening, meaning there's a an abnormality from which um, uh, a because of which a CMV t screening test is done for an infant. And this is often uh, most commonly um, targeted to the newborn hearing screen. So a, a failure of the newborn hearing screen would prompt a CMV PCR test. Universal screening is where all infants are are tested at birth, similar to the dried blood spot, which is done in all infants. So the congenital CMV was nominated to the recommended uniform screening panel a few years ago. It's still with the RUSP um, now, and that process is continuing. States don't have to follow the RUSP list of conditions, but most do. Um, and uh, several states, actually, it's mainly Connecticut and Minnesota, the New, New Jersey laws pending uh, for the future. Minnesota and very recently Connecticut uh, passed universal screening laws so that all infants in those states are screened. We have a pending law in Massachusetts and in Indiana. And uh, actually, a couple months ago, one of the Connecticut senators submitted a federal law requiring congenital CMV screening on all infants. So um, we really are at an early stage of this process. We don't know logistics of state or national implementation. Certainly, it varies by state. Many states, 17 or 18 states, have um, targeted screening laws, only two. Minnesota and Connecticut have universal screening laws. And we don't know the impact of, of all this screening on primary care practices, on departments of, of public health, but we're, we're learning as we go along. So at UMass, we have a protocol that involves um, targeted screening based on hearing, hearing screen results, as I said, and that's in the newborn nursery. In the NICU, babies born at more than 34 weeks gestation also get the same targeted screening. But we screen all infants born less than 34 weeks because they don't have their hearing screen before three weeks of age when the congenital diagnosis needs to be made. So we screen all infants that are um, admitted to the NICU at less than 34, if they're less than 34 weeks. So going back to our family, um, 
Vanessa, based on that most recent ultrasound, was taken emergently to cesarean section. The APGARs for, this is baby Logan, the APGARs were very low. That's a measure of infant well-being at birth. He required significant resuscitation. He had a number of abnormalities on, on a physical exam. Very, very low, critically low platelet count, critically low neutrophil count, and his saliva PCR was positive for CMV. And again, he had he had fairly large um, uh, lateral ventricles, meaning there was more fluid than than was normal. But otherwise, the brain was normal. So the most um, challenging thing about uh, seeing these babies, and I typically will leave at least two hours of time to spend with families with an, a new baby with congenital CMV uh, in the hospital or the office. Um, every single one of the parents, or at least the women I've seen over my entire career, has said some version of why didn't anyone tell me about CMV? If I had only known um, that I would have done things differently. And um, this is what prompts many of us to continue uh, making progress in the field toward um, eliminating some of the agony that, that we see in parents. Um, CMV can be so easily preventable. So Vanessa, we looked at the placenta uh, of um, Vanessa after birth. It showed um, clearly these viral inclusions. They're, they're viral particles inside of cells. She, she also had various other markings of congenital infection uh, of the placenta, which is these very large, huge blood vessels in the, in the chorionic villi. These are in, in cross-section. Um, as they dilate to allow more blood into the, to the fetus because a viral infection of the placenta, the placenta, which is not working well. We also stained the placenta for, for virus, and it was clearly positive, shown by these dark cells. And um, here's a, a comparison of baby Logan and how small he was at the time of birth, extremely low birth weight. So of these children that are born with congenital CMV, what happens to them? What are the possible outcomes? So most are asymptomatic at birth. And what that means is they appear normal on physical exam. It, it does not refer to the additional evaluation and testing that we do. Um, if a, a child who appears normal is diagnosed with congenital CMV, or at least if their hearing screen is abnormal, they go on to have this evaluation. So asymptomatic just means they appear normal at birth. And um, in the order on the order of 10 or 15% uh, are symptomatic at birth. Congenital CMV has about a 0.5% mortality. And if you combine all of these, um, whether asymptomatic or symptomatic, of all infants with congenital CMV infection, 18%, this is overall, if you combine this number and this number, have permanent disabilities, and those are hearing loss or neurodevelopmental disabilities. And 75% are born to seropositive women, again, um, showing us that all pregnant individuals are at risk of congenital CMV, whether they've had CMV in the past or not. We don't have really any good ways of predicting prognosis for parents. So this is a very interesting study where um, this study and data from a couple of other um, published studies looked at head imaging in, in various, various types of head imaging and neurodevelopmental outcomes. So the sensitivity of ultrasound, CAT scan, MRI, all, and or CAT scan in all of these studies um, 
resulted in a sensitivity ranging from eight or eight to 13 percent up to 100 percent. So we have no idea how sensitive these are. Um, they, they really vary based on the modality and the, the radiologist. There's more consistency in negative predictive value. So really the best prognostic factor we have is if head imaging is normal, that is a very good, has a high negative predictive value that, that um, there will be normal neurodevelopmental outcome. But we don't know the significance of isolated or mild findings, which is very common. We don't, we usually do ultrasound and we don't know if there's a benefit to MRI and we don't have any other biomarkers for prognosis. We also, um, there are also, and I won't go through this whole study, but um, head imaging is, um, whether it's ultrasound or MRI, um, is best uh, in terms of predicting hearing outcome, is best if the imaging is normal. So normal um, head imaging has about a 90% negative predictive value of um, for hearing loss, meaning it's very unlikely that there'll be hearing loss, but not delayed onset hearing loss. So hearing loss can, can develop later. So we only have this association in, um, in, uh, in early hearing loss, not delayed. There, is, there are antiviral drugs to um, treat CMV. As you recall, the, the virus stays with us for life, so it doesn't get rid of the virus, but these um, viral medications can uh, keep the virus under control for, um, for a period of time to, to while additional tissues in the, in the newborn are growing. Um, we don't have a predictor of long-term benefit. Yes, there are clinical trials, but um, uh, those, those predicted benefits are, um, are variable and uh, they certainly don't occur for all infants. So this is to show you that we have um, clinical practice guidelines. These were published um, by a group of us in 2017 they're in need of updating. Um, and basically they, they say that infants who are asymptomatic or only have hearing loss, there is no evidence that they benefit from treatment. And infants who are moderately or, or mildly affected um, would likely benefit from treatment. So um, I, I think I'll kind of go through this quickly. This is the study that um, the clinical trial that um, tells us what the current standard of care is. And the, the problem with this study, certainly it, it provides guidance on what we should be doing in terms of standard of care and treatment, but it doesn't tell us how to treat infants that do not fit the inclusion criteria. So baby Logan was well below 1800 grams and had a gestational age well below 32 weeks. So we give the drug, still give the drug um, uh, according to this um, study, I'll kind of run through here, orally. So we give Val Gancyclovir orally uh, for six months but we don't know the benefit of treatment for those other infants. So those with no or mild symptoms with isolated or late onset hearing loss, meaning no other abnormalities and with sort of global issues like prematurity or um, small for gestational age or, or small weight at birth. So let's go back to um, Logan's course. Um, I'll, I'll describe this graph on uh, the x-axis is time in weeks. Uh, up at the top is his course of the different treatments that he was on. 
And the colored lines are the, um, in green, the ANC, that's the absolute neutrophil count. In purple, the direct bilirubin, and in black, in gray, the CMV viral load. So how much blood, how much virus was in the blood. So when um, Logan was born, he was treated with gensinclavir right away. He, he was very sick at the time. And he had um, very high direct bile, meaning liver disease. He had very low neutrophil count, as I said, around 200, which is severely low, all of which improved on the treatment. Then he developed um, uh, his, his liver got better, but his blood counts got severely worse down to zero. He had no white cells in his blood. So we had some trouble with starting and stopping the drug and wondering if the low blood counts were due to virus or drug because this is uh, a side effect of the drug. And so we stopped the drug, the blood counts got better, the liver continued to get better, the virus was very low, but later on the virus increased. So we changed to the IV form. Um, liver had some trouble, blood counts better, so he was stable in this period of time. So very stable, doing quite well. At about this point, he became very sick again. Hepatitis, pneumonitis, neutropenia, and his viral load was highest um, we'd ever seen it at about 7 million copies. So back here with this virus um, level get coming up here, um, we checked the resistance to gensinclavir, which was negative. And um, when the virus went up to this um, very high level, we tested the um, resistance and it was positive, meaning there was drug resistance to gensinclavir, the drug that was being used. So changed to foscarnet another drug for CMV, and the viral load went down very nicely, very quickly, and the blood counts um, came up very nicely. So a good response to that viral medicine. As we were doing that evaluation, um, we did an MRI of the brain to, to get an update on Logan, how his brain was doing, and he had very severe abnormalities an incredible loss of brain tissue um, as shown in a number of these places with arrows. Most of this dark area is fluid that should be brain. There's a huge amount of brain loss here as well. Um, so this, this was very severe brain damage in a child who was becoming very critically ill, needing full life support at that time. So Vanessa and Peter um, decided to direct Logan's care um, to comfort measures. And he passed away of congenital CMV at about four months of age. And there's baby Logan uh, not long before he passed away. This was a very difficult decision for them, as you can imagine. But um, Vanessa and Peter have gone on with a number of us, a, a multidisciplinary group to develop or, or found the Massachusetts Congenital CMV Coalition. This is back in 2019. Um, we um, are the ones that filed the bill in the Massachusetts legislature for universal screening. We're also doing advocacy work with the Massachusetts Medical Society and the Department of Public Health, a number of, of ways to advance um, the field in Massachusetts. So I can answer more questions about that if, if people are interested. So in summary, awareness and knowledge of congenital CMV is low. Birth prevalence is equivalent regardless of maternal CMV history. 
The burden of disease is higher than many well-known pediatric conditions. Universal newborn screening and diagnosis allows education, evaluation, monitoring, treatment, guidance, support, and research. And parent and family advocacy leads to change. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Dr. Gibson, thank you so much for that informative presentation. I would like to now start our live Q&A portion of the webinar. And to our audience, if you have any questions you would like to ask, please do so now. Just type them into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. And Dr. Gibson, we have quite a few questions already coming in, so I'm just going to dive in here. Um, let's start with this first question. What would be your gold standard for testing in neonates and newborns with blood, urine, or saliva? The, the regimen of saliva screening and then a urine test, these are both PCR, for um, confirmation of a positive saliva is a, a, a protocol that works very well. Um, the, the blood testing or dried blood spot testing is, is not ready for screening. Um, so that's, I, I, I wouldn't advocate for that. Although some people do that, it can be certainly be done in retrospect, um, but the sensitivity isn't high enough at this point for blood. Very good, thank you. Next question. Can a woman suffering from mouth breathing, breathing nasal discomfort, be affected by a virus given that this chronic pathology, therefore will her baby suffer from the same situation as her mother? I'm not sure that has to do with um, CMV in particular, because um, nasal or mouth breathing isn't a symptom of CMV in adults or in children that we would typically see. Thank you. And Dr. Gibson, what FDA cleared PCR assays are available for congenital CMV testing? So the there are a few, and um, at least Meridian uh, has one. And uh, I don't I don't know if your test is is DSORN's test is FDA cleared. I think it is, but of course you'll you'll know the answer to that. <laughs> Thank you. And is there any type of immunization available soon for this? Not soon, uh, but the good news is that um, many more companies now compared to, I don't know, five years ago, are study have a CMV vaccine platform. Um, so that's great, great news for progress. Very good. And I do want to note that the DSORN molecular is approved. Yes, I thought it was. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Gibson, lots of physicians say that if the CMV can be transmitted in primary or non-primary infection, what is the usefulness of screening pregnant women? Um, there isn't a lot of usefulness right now, and that's why it's not recommended as standard of care. One of the um, reasons is that, yes, all we have for prevention right now is behavioral <laughs> Um, behaviors to minimize contact with body fluids with virus in it. Mm -hmm. And so that information should be given to all pregnant women, regardless of their test result. So that's one reason that the test isn't typically done. Other reasons include, you know, as I said, the results are often confusing. Um, and so, and there's no current intervention during pregnancy to prevent transmission of the virus from um, the pregnant individual to the fetus, regardless of what the test results are. So there are a number of reasons that it's not recommended. Thank you. And I do want to clarify one more time that DSRN does have a PCR 510K cleared assay with both urine and saliva sample types. Um, and I do think we have time for one more question here. Um, Children at which age shed most of the CMV DNA? Um, 
usually at birth, um, but it can be weeks, months, or even years before they clear. So certainly they all have it at birth in very high amounts, but and then they clear it at various times after that. Very good. Thank you. And Dr. Gibson, um, we are just topping the, um, the top of the hour. So do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, again, thanks everybody for coming and I'd be certainly happy to answer questions offline if there are any more. Very good. Thank you so much for your time today and your important research, Dr. Gibson. I do wanna thank LabRoots and our sponsor, DSOR and Molecular for underwriting today's educational webcast. I do want to thank our audience also for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We do have quite a few questions that weren't answered and your questions that we didn't answer today. And additionally, those questions that come in during the on-demand period, they will be answered via the email address you provided at the time of registration. Today's webcast can be viewed on demand. A few of you submitted some questions asking about that. It will be available for replay in about approximately one hour and Labrads will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you so much for joining us and again Dr. Gibson thank you for your time today. Thank you. Have a great day everyone. Bye everybody.